know, get to know the kids first. Playing the bass is, it's important that they know that, but getting to know the kids, kids will talk to you about anything and everything. And they all have different journeys, different paths, different interests. And when they start seeing that their interests and their paths can give them a future, the light that comes on inside of them is, is blinding. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we are bringing you today an episode with Dennis Whitaker. Dennis is the principal bass of the Houston Grand Opera and teaches bass at the University of Houston. He's had a fascinating journey through the music world, and there's so many great takeaways from our conversation here, which we're breaking into three parts. Part one is life in an opera orchestra. Part two, staying in shape for the long haul. And part three, the paths of our lives. And we have some great sponsors for this episode, the Upton Bass String Instrument Company, A440, and the Bass Violin Shop. We'll be talking more about them later. You'll also hear several excerpts today from both Dennis playing solo Bach and Dennis along with David Young performing opera excerpts. And these are from a session that David Young and Dennis Whitaker did at the 2013 International Society of Basses Convention. And definitely check out the complete video of this in the show notes. So part one, what is life like in an opera orchestra? The opera season runs from October through May, pretty much. We do, we do six operas per season, two at a time. And uh, we just finished the ring cycle. We just finished playing my very first ring cycle, which, you know, at this point in my career, well, at any point in the career is a thrilling thing. So we did one per year. And after we finished, I just called David Young and, and chatted with him about the thrill of doing it. And he was so excited for, we just sat for 30 minutes with me talking, you know, on that one part where this happened. And, and he asked me what I, what I learned from playing it. And for me, it was, it was that it's not near as much as it's made out to be in terms of force and power. It's not about force. It's such a tightly composed set of operas that every bit of material is related to something else in the opera. There's no, filler material that he throws in and it's not boring. It's not long. It's exciting to play. And we played with six bases. Paul Ellison always got to sit in with us for the run of the section. And it was his first go to Dameron. He's done a number of them and playing in that opera with him in the back of the section is, is like a masterclass every day. So anytime I was feeling any tension or anything, I just look over at him and see how he stands and I go, Oh, okay. And then, you know, I'm fine. Um, in terms of shifting my body, moving my back, dropping my shoulder, whatever it is, but to see to see him at you know at his point in his career still hitting that opera with every bit of creative energy that he's got and technical energy and musical knowledge is incredibly inspiring. But I I loved it. I loved every bit of the Ring Cycle. That's uh, we did the Britain operas a few years back, and that, those were some of my favorite projects too. And then this coming year, we're doing Julius Caesar again by Handel, which in some ways is the most difficult opera I've ever played, just because Handel is nonstop. Whereas Wagner is, is long and tough, but you've got breaks while everybody else is doing their thing. But Handel, there's always a baseline, and you've got to be able to rock a baseline. And you've got to be able to do something different and interesting in every aria for three and a half hours. But I'm looking forward to it. Next, we dig into Handel operas and the Julius Caesar Overture in particular, why these are so great when you're thinking about preparing for an opera audition. They're the ones that I recommend when people come to me and ask me how to prepare for opera playing. I just say, go get a Handel opera off of wherever you can get it and play along with the recording. They're as interesting to me as Bach. Is that maybe not, they're not as, as sophisticated in some ways, but they tell a story they they're technically crazy complicated for the modern bass and uh and just in terms of variety they're great things to warm up with at the beginning
You're listening to Dennis play the Julius Caesar Overture. And if you'd like to follow along with this, there's a link in the show notes for it. Or if you're listening on the Contra Race Conversations app, it's included for this episode. Here's why Dennis likes this Julius Caesar excerpt. I, I ask for it as often as I can on, on the Houston Opera audition list, but it's, it's my favorite excerpt to listen to, to play, first of all, just because it's a great technical warm-up. It musically forces me to play gently and airy on the low E string without, without any force. And it's interesting and it's fun. I absolutely love the piece. So when I, when I give it to students or somebody to have them play for me, you can tell right away whether they're taking it seriously, whether they know the spirit of Handel, whether they know, you know what the overture is. And plus, it's not done that much. So you can just see how somebody gets to play instead of how they've been taught and run through the machine of our standard orchestral rep list. What do you tell people when they're getting ready for an audition? Just this, I mean, the magnitude of the operatic repertoire and like, how do you even begin to approach uh, or what, what, what do you recommend that people do when they're trying to get ready for something like a Houston audition? Well, I think number one is that an opera uh, audition is not that much different from a symphony audition in terms that the basics have to be there. You've got to play in tune in, with a beautiful tone. You've got to know the piece for sure. And so all the basics have to be there. You have to know the audition. But in terms of getting the music, the first thing I tell the students is to find a recording that you fall in love with. Find and listen to opera a lot. And, it's, and you can do passive listening. You can have opera running around in the background as much as you can. But the biggest problem that I hear when people come play to me is, is a lack of dynamics, usually. What I find is a lot of students are, when they prepare for opera, it's a different type of musical energy that they're trying to create than what they're experiencing in their everyday life. If you listen to the radio, if you listen to recordings of rock or pop, and I'm not, you know, I play that all the time, so I'm not saying don't listen to it. But if you're, if you're really investing yourself into a career, put it off to the side and sit in a very quiet room and listen to a beautifully produced recording of opera where you can hear them play with the color and the dynamics. Even operas are run through compression, but when you listen to pop music, there's no variation in dynamics. And so when you turn that switch off in your brain to go from listening to pop or rock or energy or anything on the radio, which is run through Pro Tools, it's compressed, it's flat, it's short, there's no scope to it. And then you, you switch that off and you say, okay, now it's time to start learning opera. Then there's a break in the, the energy flow that you have in your general musical experience day to day. Listening to, to Donizetti and Puccini and Verdi and getting a sense of that Italian bel canto rhythm and language and uh, the iambic rhythm of the phrasing and the way that they taper off on the notes has to become part of your unconscious vocabulary. And it's hard to do that when you're listening to the radio all the time in a moving car surrounded by traffic when there's a lot of other noise around. So what I try to get students to do when they're auditioning or they're really playing opera is to get into a flow where what they bring into the room is what they've been experiencing outside of the lesson room every week, just listening to, to any recording they, they can get and then come in and talk to me about it and what they find. And that, that makes a huge difference. And you really can tell right away who's been listening to really beautifully crafted dynamic phrases and tonal phrases, and who's just been listening to flat dynamics.
playing opera just on a consistent basis has maybe changed your approach to music in general. Yeah, it's, I remember uh, somebody asked Edgar about his bass, and Edgar mentioned something about the bass. He said, well, a lot of my technique and a lot of the way that I play has been determined by the instrument that I have. And, and that always intrigued me about that synthesis of person and instrument, because the instrument has taught him as much about what he needs to do in his playing as you know, he's brought to the bass. But in, ter- in terms of how the opera has changed me, it essentially keeps me grounded that what I have to be able to play as a musician is just a good bass line. My whole summer project now is to try to get through all the box suites seamlessly. So I've been, I've been saturating myself with that. And it's fun to play solos. It's fun to play Botticini. But in the end, all we really have to do is just play a bass line, a beautiful bass line. And that consists of all the musical elements that all of my teachers ever said to me, but I never really knew how to synthesize until I started playing opera. So the way that I play Puccini and the way that you just create a big, long, beautiful tone in, in La Boheme, there's a bass solo, but all it is is a low A and it lasts, you know, it's, it's Mimi's death scene and it's a low A and it's played for maybe 25 seconds or so. And I always get nervous before I play it because I think, okay, am I going to play open? Am I going to play, with vibrato, non-vibrato, what am I going to do to it? Am I going to grow? Am I going to shape it? There's a ton of musical things you can do to a single note. And all the technique that I have is focused on bringing whatever imagination I can to this long note. And it's always thrilling when I play it, because if you play it right, it's, it brings a ton of emotional gravity to Mimi's death. Another solo that I remember was in the Britain operas, there's The Rape of Lucretia, Britain writes a pizzicato upper glissando from a low B flat, and it's supposed to mimic a bullfrog in a lake. You play that, and you play it, I don't know, 30 or 40 times, and it gets really mesmerizing. And the energy that I do in doing one simple gesture like that brings me as much joy as playing a box suite, if you do it right. And then there's Handel, which, you know, like I said, has, has the best bass lines in some ways in, in opera, but they're nonstop. And every bass line has to be energetic and spirited and, and sometimes sad and sometimes ahead of the beat and sometimes behind the beat. It's just about playing a bass line. It's about being a musician and it's about knowing your place in the finished product. And that's, that's where opera keeps me. It keeps me in the bass realm instead of launching me into the solo realm or, you know, yeah, anything like that. So I I like having technique where I can reach up to the end of the fingerboard. I like having technique where I can stand for hours and play all over the fingerboard. But in the end, it's just artistically what you can create in the money positions that's really going to bring it to it. And it's an immense amount of satisfaction. That was part one, life in an opera orchestra. Now for part two, we're getting into staying in shape for the long haul. Why Dennis decided to start standing for opera performances. What's freeing about standing. We talk about power playing and sitting. How to get through a massive section like the end of Lohengrin. Truly bafflingly challenging chunk of music. And how Dennis practices technique, the three types of technical workouts that he does on the bass. All this in part two. Before we dive in, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Upton Bass. It's so great to have them back on board. And I'm talking today about their Brescian model, which is the first bass that they really got geeky about when they began to refine the Upton basses. Now, Gary, the founder of Upton, he loves English basses. He's from England. And, you know, most English basses are straight out of the Brescian school, thus the name for this Upton model. They've got big bodies. They've got deep ribs, tall arches, and violin corners. It's one of their most commissioned basses. And they actually took it to Copenhagen in 2012 for Base Europe and won first place for Tone with the playing jury. John Patitucci is a fan. He's got one in Berkeley as well as one in South America at the Daniel Perez Foundation. Great instruments. Upton's doing great things. They have been for years. They continue to innovate. And you can check them out at uptonbass.com. 
I'd also like to thank A440 Violin Shop. They are a longtime favorite of mine out of Chicago. They are in Roscoe Village, which is just a charming neighborhood west of Wrigley Field in Chicago, right off the train. I've had them work on several bases over the years, and I've always been thrilled with what they've done. They are committed to fairness and value. They have tons of satisfied customers from the local, national, and international string playing communities. They've got clients in major symphony orchestras, podcasters like me, professional orchestra and chamber music players, aspiring students, amateur adult players, all kinds of jazz, commercial musicians, university music department faculty, public school teachers, you name it. They are a wonderful resource for discerning violin, viola, cello, and bass players everywhere. They've got a great line of pedigree instruments. They've got great student instruments. And you can check them out at a440violinshop.com. Okay, part two of today's episode, staying in shape for the long haul. How do you take care of yourself physically for just that? What is inevitably some punishment uh, playing bass in the pit like that? <laughs> it can be punishment, and conditioning is a big part of it. I stood for Gotterdamerung because I don't like sitting on a stool for five hours. I can't. I can't keep my hips in place, and I can't bring the energy to the bass that I want to when I can sway. So, you know, my, my studies with Paul have really helped me in terms, and watching him speak have helped me in terms of just general posture. There's a gorilla stance where you keep your knees bent, you keep your hips outwards just a little bit, and you keep your back tall, but leaning forward just a little bit. And it feels like you're just standing like an ape, but it's incredibly good for your spine. So what I, what I did in Wagner was first I started standing for all the offers before that. I got a nice little set of Dr. Scholl's comfortable insoles for my shoes. I wore the same pair of shoes for the whole season. So I know, you know, what, what shape the heels are taking at any time. And, and then I learned, uh, um, I balanced with my base. So I have a big English base with the, uh, Labrie end pin into it. So the base base block is drilled. And so the base is leaning into me, which gives me some energy. And so it's not that I'm leaning on the base, but when I, when I lean forward, it's certainly offsetting a little bit of my balance. I use a lot of dynamic balance where I shift on my legs, a lot. I don't stand fixed in one place. That's, that's an unstable position. So moving around the balance point, just swaying on my feet, swaying forward and back and letting the base sway with me is a stronger position for me and gives me a, a lot more endurance. I have to keep my elbows down by my side for most of what I play um, instead of keeping my elbow way up. So it's forced me to learn to press the strings down in a way where whatever fingers are not playing the strings are relaxed and they're released. They're not tense. So when I'm playing my fourth finger, I'm using a pinch between my thumb and, and pinky and my elbow is as low as I can comfortably get it. And then when I put down my first finger, I have the backwards pinch where I raise the elbow just a little, a little bit. So the technique for the long operas for me is really about balance in every joint that I can find. And it's forced me with my right arm to, I play French bow, but when I'm feeling particularly tired and my shoulders getting fatigued, I'll just switch the grip to underhand so I can drop my elbow close to my side. It takes some of the pressure off of the arm, off my shoulder, and then I can bring it up again. So for me, for endurance for the long operas is about releasing any muscles that I don't need and swaying staying comfortable, staying very loose as much as I can. And then when I'm off, I, I try to condition my core planks and sit-ups and push-ups and a little bit of cardio at the gym so that I can, I know that my body is working for me. So I don't have to try to ask it to do anything that it, it doesn't feel ready to do. What have you found freeing about standing that sitting was sort of like causing challenges for you? There's a, there's a number of challenges. First of all, in, in our pits, space is very limited. So the benefits of not having a stool in a very tight, closed space, first of all, is very good because it, it creates more space for everybody. Second, for me, is, is the base. I have this uh, very large English base that is shaped a lot like, like uh, Ed Barker's base. It's an unnamed English base that was owned by a man named Dick Topper in the Cincinnati Orchestra. And a long ways before him, it was actually owned by 
an English freelancer named Bruce B. Mollison, who was the principal bass player on the Empire Strikes Back soundtrack. So I like calling this my Star Wars bass. But it's got these gigantic shoulders, and finding a stool where I can get around on top of the bass like I need to is not very easy. I've got my metal stool with, uh, with the round rungs on it, the drafting stool, and a classical guitar footrest for when I really have to stabilize the bass. And that's for power playing. So I like playing Beethoven 5 sitting down because the bass is, is really locked against my body. But in opera, that setup, I can't hold that tight, tense setup for three or four hours. Because, my again, it locks my hips into place. It locks my legs into place. I don't have that free swaying motion that um, gives me a lot of energy recovery when I play. The opera owns some stools, but the distance between the seat and the rung is fixed. So you can raise the stool, but the leg comes up with it. So then what that does is it locks my left leg into a, a tight angle that's uncomfortable. And that's not comfortable for three hours either. So I think it's liberating to me and I don't, I don't mind standing, but uh, I've also done it for when I, I think I started standing about 15 years ago consistently. And so I I've learned over 10 or 15 years how to stand and how to play it and, and how to be comfortable and how to be, how to get endurance out of it. And, and with the Houston Grand Opera too, we do such a variety of styles where it's not always about power. It's rarely about power. We're doing Electra next year. That's going to be about power. And <laughs> sure. um, that, that one, and it's an hour and a half. So I may actually, I may sit for that one because it's a, it's a very short opera and it's very strong and it's a lot of playing. So I'm, I'm thinking now that I will sit for it, but for the longer ones, when I stand for a long time, it, it, it's better on my back. I've tried sitting and after, after about an hour and a half, I'll stand up from the stool. My back will pop and the hips will be a little locked in place. And I just have to readjust. And I don't like that. The real trick for me on the English bass was essentially learning how to use my hips, learning how to use the contact point of the bass against my hip and belly. Once I could learn to control, to put the neck on my shoulder by throwing my hips back instead of leaning into the bass. That's, that was the game changer for me. And that was one of the big epiphanies in my own practice was learning how to, when I bent my knees, the bass came on my shoulder. So that's another thing. When I sit down, in order for me to get that contact point of the neck on my shoulder, I have to lean forward. And that's a much different feeling on, on my back. The clinic that Dennis did along with David Young at the 2013 ISB convention ended with this powerhouse excerpt from Wagner's Longer, just the most punishing thing you can imagine, two pages of pain. And by the way, if you want to check out that pain, you can download that. There's a link in the show notes along with the Julius Caesar earlier from this episode. And I dig in with Dennis into how the heck you can even manage to get through something like this. But first, let's listen to a brief excerpt of David and Dennis playing this. played just that like punishing triplet in right. Lohengrin, I think. And man, yeah. that, that reminded me of, it's like the the page from the last one of Beethoven 9, but make it like five right. pages. Right? <laughs> and, and, and like, <laughs> like, like when, you're, when you're playing something like that, I mean, I was just thinking, I was just getting exhausted watching you go through that. And then you said like, hey, <laughs> page two, you know, and like, how do you, yeah. how do you keep from just completely losing it physically? I mean, to me, that's like harder than powerlifting, playing something like that. Like, what, <laughs> like what's going through your mind when you're, gearing up for something like that, like staying relaxed or like, because you kept your, you were like playing nice, big forte fortissimo the whole way through nice articulation. I can just see like my bow falling out of my hand halfway through that first page. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the technique is, is absolutely important and it's in preparation and it's in repetitions too. But you know, it's it, nothing that, that I can ever, nothing that I can say. And all of my thoughts before I went into that first rehearsal where we did it, none of my preparation worked. Uh, I mean, when, once you're, once you're with the orchestra and you're trying to, because it's, it's all that, that particular section is all string parts in unison or in, you know, four octaves apart. So the violins are playing it, the old cello, they're all playing the same line. And then the trumpets are playing this big grand March melody. 
but it's you can't you can't receive and adapt like you can in a regular chamber music piece it's you just your focus just trying to survive it's all about survival but so it's it's mainly it's just repetitions it's first of all finding a finger that works getting it up to you know quarter note at 70 and then doing it again the next day and it's and just do it five times per day if you make a mistake you recover and you keep going but there's no looking in the rear view mirror when you're playing something like that there's no, if you make a mistake, you have to let it go by without looking at it. You, do, you have to keep, you know, go on to the next one. So repetitions are incredibly important. So for me, I would just, I would hit it three times a day and do it again the next day and do it again the next day and do it. And always with the metronome, I would do it two times just for tempo. And then I would do it the third time trying to be expressive because there's a lot of dynamics and stuff in it. But in Lohengrin, that's, that's in act three. So you've already played about three hours worth of Wagner before you have to get to that. So you, you have to save and it, and it is exhausting and it is like powerlifting. So the, my, your core has to be a lot stronger, but then you also have to play it as I had to play it as close to the frog as I could under my first finger. If I had to engage my thumb, and get out further in the bow to engage any torque, I would have lost, I couldn't have been able to sustain it. So the whole point of staying at the frog is just to drop it right under the index finger and learn how to drop it uh, from from the back. So my elbow would stay loose, and and then at the same time I'd have to get as much on top of the base as I can, so my arm is hanging straight down and not up at all. If it's if it's up at all, I lose power. And, and there's a, a ton of ton of little details that, that go through my head with it. But then once you start, it's all muscle memory that you have to go through. And I loved playing it with David, too, because as soon as I mentioned that to him, he said, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Because he, but he knew what the challenge was with it, but he was up for it. And I'd never seen it before. But it's, it, was, it was fun. It's an incredibly rewarding uh, excerpt to learn and to play. When the heat is on, it's the middle of the season, like what, what do you do to stay healthy on the base and working on what you need to be working on? Sure. I have, I have three routines that I, that I work on. One is when I have a lot of time, and that's two hours. And that's when I will run through. The first part of it is usually me playing through the etudes in uh, the Belay book, ER263 is the catalog number. These are all, all uh, etudes that are in the lower octave of the fingerboard. I know them really well, and that's when I work on my, on my endurance and my left hand shaping. And then I'll, I'll do scales and bowings you know, and just general things that I'm trying, trying for. The, other, uh, the second one is, is what I call about a 45-minute to a one-hour rehearsal where I have just a little bit of time to do, and I will run a scale workout. I'll pick just one scale, and I'll run slurs, slurs plus separate, off-the-string bowings, quicker bowings. I'll try to work up the velocity, and then I'll cool down, and that's a scale one. And then the, the maintenance one is when I have about 10 or 15 minutes, and that's usually when I show up before an opera or when I'm at school and I have some time in between lessons. And then I have about four exercises that I do. I do the, the Gary Carr Kosman exercises, the bumblebees. And then I'll do these uh, double stop exercises by Donald Palma that, are, that uh, I go across all four strings with double stops just for hand strength. And I do that three times. And then I do the, uh, these finger twister exercises called uh, Max's Magic, Max demo thing. So, and I'll run that three times. So, so those three times, I'll just I'll work up a little burn in my forearm, let it die off, work up another burn, let it die off, and then work up another one. And that's, that's my short maintenance one. But in the heat of the season, when I've got a lot of teaching and living in Houston is tough just because the urban sprawl makes the commutes very large. So you, you try to grab whatever stolen moments you can of practice time. So that's it. I, I, you know, I know when I get to the base, I know that I have something ready to run and something ready to challenge my fingers. And then when I have a, a good spare time, you know, I'll run, a, I'll run a suite top to bottom with no repeats just to get myself going all over the base. Because I know when I can do those on my big English base, I know things are working for me. I 
love those descriptions of power playing and how to stay relaxed and stay free, standing through these long performances, playing passages that are as potentially exhausting as those longer in pages. So many great takeaways. And for part three, we're talking about the paths of our lives. And Dennis has such a great story. You're going to love it. Before we dive in, I want to thank our final sponsor, the Bass Violin Shop. And if you are looking for a bass bow, they've got a great line of French and German bows. You can get a entry-level student bow or something all the way up to a Frechner, Nuremberger. So many great selections at the Bass Violin Shop. And so many satisfied customers. Rick Jones of Acoustic Image, he goes to the bass violin shop for his setups. He's got an Olive G, a Parad CD, a Spiracore Vike A, and a Spiracore Orchestra E. And he stopped using the Olives and Parazis for a while because it just wouldn't speak on his bass. But he brought his bass into the bass violin shop and they got it sounding great. He played a gig right after that setup and it worked great. The strings have a stronger fundamental to make the notes pop, resulting in better quarter notes. What more can you ask? And that's coming from Rick Jones of Acoustic Image. That's high praise for sure. Be sure to check them out at BassViolinShop.com. You've heard a lot from Dennis already, but we haven't really covered his journey. And he started off as a music ed major. So let's hear as we start part three, Dennis's journey from being a music ed student to where he is today. It's a, it's a messy journey. I mean, it's, I get students come in and say, man, how did I want to get to, I want to do what you're doing. How do I get there? And I wouldn't, I mean, it's, it's nuts. I try not to presume to have this survivor bias where I've got a job. Let me show you all how to do it. Cause like, I, I like the focus of a lot of your last podcasts have been on this, on students going through their own journey and trying to recover and trying to make something of it. So it's, it's, I think it's along that terms, but I grew up in Kansas city with two amazing music teachers that loved teaching kids. One was a choir director named Bill Grace and my orchestra director's name was Barbara Hale, she was a flute player and she was a studio flute player in Kansas City. So I grew up around teachers that loved music and loved people. So my orchestra director would take me to the community orchestras where I would got a lot of exposure in high school playing symphonies with community orchestras. And so when I went to Baylor, I didn't really know what a career was. I just wanted to know that I wanted to play for people. And I knew that playing was something that I had to do. So I was playing in jazz bands, making money on the side. I was taking every freelance orchestra job I could get. And uh, I majored in music education because I I, I honestly just didn't think I was good enough to get into an orchestra. And I don't know where that came from, but that was that was just part of it. But I knew that getting a music education teaching job, I wanted to be like my teachers that I grew up with in high school. So majored in music education. And then in uh, 86, I won the Gary Carr competition, which was a big slap in the face. And it woke me up thinking maybe I could do something with the playing. So uh, that's when I went to Northwestern, studied with Jeff for a year, got a a great dose of power playing technique, velocity, uh, plus being in 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 a very hot music climate. After that, once, once I was finished with my one year, masters at the time in order for me to get a job the the job that was open that was able to pay the most was a teaching job in waco texas at a high school down there so i wanted to go down there and i wanted to change the world for the kids so i wanted to to you know teach him mozart and beethoven plus a lot of modern composers that were out and i didn't know anything about i mean i had student taught before and i had student taught in waco so i sort of sort of knew what the kids were but i had all these great dreams and i was very green and so I was teaching there, and the second week I was on cafeteria duty, and I was, was watching, and, and I saw these two girls get into a fight, and they just, they locked in an embrace real quick, there was a scream, and they split up, and, and one girl had bitten the lower half of the other girl's ear off. And, and I saw it sitting on the floor, and I'm, you know, out of music school, and I thought, I am, you know, I'm way over my head in this, because my, my goals are wrong. I can't teach Beethoven to kids who are worried that they're going to lose an ear when they come to school. So that same day, I was sitting wondering what I was going to do. And somebody had put up a little post-it note next to my desk that had said, you don't teach music, you teach people, which was exactly what I needed to hear at that time. So I changed my focus from wanting to play the best music and be the best bass player that I could be just to get to know the kids and get to know the families 
and teach what I could. And when I let that go, a lot of things slipped into place. And you start listening to the kids. You get to know the high school kids. I taught in Waco for two years, and I, and I still had the Gary Carr base, but I wasn't playing because I was just focusing on the teaching. Moved down to Houston and started teaching in a, in a school down there and taught in Houston for four and a half years. And during that time, I, I think when I got to Houston, I probably hadn't played seriously for about two, two and a half years. And I started teaching at a middle school in Houston. And during that time, I'm, I made friends with a guitar player, and he was playing jazz at a Cuban nightclub on uh, Saturday nights. So I started playing jazz down there, and I brought the, the car bass back out again and started playing. My, you know, my fingers were sore, my hands were sore, but over about a month or two, I started to get my chops back and started to realize, too, that, that practicing, when I get back from school and would be exhausted at the end of the day, I realized that a two-hour practice session actually gave me more energy recovery than I brought into it. So I was more energized at the end of practice. So I worked over that hump, started practicing some more, and then uh, taught for four and a half years, loved the kids, loved the families, and I still miss teaching middle school. Middle school is my favorite age to teach because you can be fearless in middle school, and the kids are curious and imaginative, and they take risks. And they bring a lot of enthusiasm to it. You know, they still have their, every kid has their own situations. So around that time, I, I felt like I had my old, my old chops back again. And I had the LeMay bass and I was love playing and I got the excerpts that the, you know, my chops back up. So around 1995, 96, three things happened. There was an opening in the Houston Grand Opera Orchestra for principal. And then there was an audition for the Houston Symphony sub list. And then um, Owen Lee ended up leaving the University of Houston to go up to Cincinnati. And he was, Owen was teaching at the University of Houston at the time. So I uh, applied for and got the job at University of Houston, won a spot on the sub list and won principal of the opera. And that was while I was teaching. So the kids loved watching me go freelance. They loved watching me go rehearse with the symphony. I'd have to miss a couple of days of school, but I was lucky to have a principal that was able to, to brag on that and see the virtue in it instead of keep me from doing it. The kids got energized too. So I started playing that. And then just generally over the course of it, the playing started to overtake the teaching and I had to make a choice. So I chose to, to uh, leave the steady paycheck of teaching into the unpredictable paycheck of freelancing and, you know, playing that way. And so I started pursuing more. And that's when I made the switch was right around 1996. But the things that, the things that stayed with me in terms of private teaching and workshops and the kids are, you know, get to know the kids first playing the bases. It's important that they know that, but getting to know the kids, kids will talk to you about anything and everything. And they all have different journeys, different paths, different interests. And when they start seeing that their interests and their paths can give them a future, the light that comes on inside of them is, is blinding. And I love seeing that. And I love seeing kids learn that they have control over their own path instead of having to do all the time what the, what everybody else tells them to do. Dennis had the chance to play a recital on the Karku Savitsky bass a few years ago. I had the chance to do this as well. And we talk about this experience. It's a fascinating experience. If you haven't done it, I highly recommend it if you have the chance. And Dennis also filmed or had filmed this great short video about his experiences on the bass and some excerpts of him playing the bass. So we're going to listen to this excerpt right now and you get to hear a little bit about Dennis's experiences and then we'll dig a little deeper. This bass belonged to Serge Kusevitsky who was a virtuoso double bass player who later became a conductor. After Kusevitsky died, the bass was left over to his widow, a lady named Olga Kusevitsky. So one day Olga Kusevitsky went to go hear a young man named Gary Carr play at Town Hall in New York City. And during the recital, she looked up and saw the ghost of Serge Kusevitsky with his arms crossed, standing behind Gary Carr. 
and she was a spiritualist, so she took that as an omen that the bass was belonging to Gary Carr. So Gary Carr took that as a token of generosity and gratitude, and he used this bass to build his career on. He called it Kusi, because named after Kusevitsky. Gary Carr recently retired about 10 years ago, and he gave this to the International Society of Basses to, to be held in perpetuity. They gave it to me, and I get it for a couple of months, and after I'm done with the recital, I get to send it back to Nashville. The fact that Kusevitsky and Gary Carr have played this, the instrument has taken on a very particular voice and a very particular freedom, having been played by the masters. It was believed to have been made in 1650 by the Amati family, but it's, that's a grand claim and everybody was skeptical about it. So professional string players took the instruments and examined the wood, examined the grain, examined everything about it, and deduced that it was probably made in France around 1800. For me, the fact that I'm playing this, I do feel like I'm in inhabiting the voice of Gary Carr and inhabiting the voice of Serge Kusevitsky, like I'm adding my own voice to the instrument. When I've shown this to people, there is a sense of awe, and there's definitely a presence that comes along the room and they realize that they're in this. I prefer to think of it that Kusevitsky's still around, making sure that everybody does music correctly. I had the experience of playing that bass too, which for me was one of the most fascinating things. I think, and there's a video <laughs> up online, some of you like you're talking about how you feel like you got the voice of Gary Carr a little bit there, which was like yeah. totally yeah. my experience, right? Playing that bass. <laughs> and, and like it's what, funny, isn't it? Yeah. Well, like yeah. what was it like for you playing on that for a couple months and doing a recital? What do, do you remember like how it felt playing that bass? It took me back to being a kid. The first I saw Gary Carr in high school in 1982 or 83 he was playing with the kansas city symphony and he had that bass and and that was the first time that a solo bass sound entered my ear and i i remember it i, I hold on to that sound you know like a like a crystal vase i just i remember every bit of color that he got out of it and so when i got that bass that was the first thing i tried to do was make it sound like that and of course I couldn't, but that, but I was changing everything about my playing to try to get that sound that I remembered. And, um, it, and, and it really did, did change me. And I think it put all my priorities out of whack, but it was really fun to try to recapture that little, that part of your childhood, you know, but also just try to get where the, where the spirit of Gary Carr was, where was the sounding point? How much weight was he using? But I couldn't do it with my, with my little French bow. So I found a balance point. But it, it, it really was strange because it was, you, try, you, you don't know how to be yourself with that bass. It's such a powerful force. I'm trying to figure out how to be Gary or how to be what Kusevitsky was or try to tap into it. But once I, once I you know, learned how not to overplay it, it, again, it's the same thing. When people hear K Gary play, they think he's using force and strength and power. And, and Gary knows how to just relax his back and keep his shoulder down and use his back muscles to pull the sound out. And it's done with a lot of freedom. So once, once I learned how to get that freedom back in, the bass started opening up. But I must play that thing four or five hours a day. It was, it was an absolute joy to play. I loved it. And I, and I was so grateful to, uh, to ISB. I love this mission they have of, of letting people play on that bass. Because it's, it's a, you know, another great aspect of our community is, is letting people share in this experience. So, yeah, I loved it. And I loved cr crafting the program in a Gary Carr style recital, you know, so I got, got to do, um, London Dairy Air and the uh, Van Gogh Scherzo and all those things. It was just, it was great. And the Kusevitsky second movement. I loved it. Always like to end these episodes with some words of wisdom. So I posed the following question to Dennis. 16, 17, 18 year olds that are, let's just say, gunning for a professional music career. Like, like what, and you've had so much experience, like what, what are some of the key things you, you try to g give them in terms of navigating their, whatever they do in college? Oh, uh, that, that is a big question. Yeah, I know. I, I, there, and a, a couple of quotes come to mind. I think it was David Walter that somebody asked him that question. He said, if somebody wants 
talk, if somebody comes to me and says they want a career in music, the first thing I try to do is talk them out of it. Okay. <laughs> uh, but if they, per, if they persist and they say they absolutely have to do it, then you work like hell to make sure that they get in somehow. But, but that was a different world. So the, the great thing about our base community now is that our base community is populated by people in all areas of, of base playing and application. So I think for, for a young kid, the, the best weapon they have at their disposal is exposure. So you, you take them to the ISB conventions, you introduce them to people who are doing what they want to do, and they start to see people who are enthusiastic about being a luthier or enthusiastic about being, you know, a, a music teacher, college teacher, or a chamber music. You know, they see Lewis or Renan doing their things in chamber music. And, and it's not just about the orchestra job anymore. Um, I talk to the kids a lot about the ideas of outreach in music education and that making a living and being happy on bass can mean a million different things. It's not just about being in an orchestra. Um, these kids, the 17, 18, 19-year-old kids, have this incredible artistic energy to them. But something happens when you get into an orchestra where you relegate your artistic energies to a larger institution with a mission that's not the same as yours. And usually there's there's a little bit of a, a mental switch that happens when a kid wins an orchestra job. So the other thing that I have to talk to them about is, are, do you want to work for yourself or do you want to work for the man? Do you want to work for somebody else? And what is their mission? I like the mission of the Kansas City Symphony going on in Kansas City right now. It has a lot of, lot of energy, a lot of support in a big way. The, minute, minute, the uh, uh, energy of the Houston Grand Opera and the mission of the Houston Grand Opera is, has gone from when I first joined, their main mission under David Gockley was to put out world premiere recordings, look for uh, the best co- composers. So they did Nixon in China and plan nine from outer space. We, they have this huge wealth of, of these really groundbreaking recordings, but now we have a new music director and his mission is local. He wants to pr- put on operas of local stories of, um, you know, lo- uh, local immigrants, local life in Texas, things like that. And, and I love being a part of that. I love being a part of the energy of a company that is really trying to find itself in the local scene. So for young, young kids have to, they they have to be exposed to all of the different artistic paths that are available and what it means to be an artist in our community and in our society right now. Um, everybody, and they think we have, it's the world has gotten smaller. So everybody sees artists doing grand things on a large scale, but it, it doesn't mean much to do that if you don't know how to be an artist on a local scale. So doing things, uh, you know, like Lloyd Goldstein does playing at, at the hospice centers and things like that is, is a beautiful application of it, of playing bass and of music and of a love for people. So um, I think, uh, and then there's the financial reality of teaching and music education. And the reason that the bass students at University of Houston have been so successful in education is because we talk an, an awful lot about about a the financial realities, which is which is a big deal for a lot of uh, college students. Um, the prospects we're lucky in Houston. You look in the paper, and there's 74 jobs opening, so you can go get a mu- music education degree. Which again, for me, on a lot of levels, the pedagogy knowledge and the education skills are as much of a skill, if not more so, than playing the bass. Playing the basses, it, once you get the pedagogy down and, and you know all the state-of-the-art pedagogy that's out there, then that's a craft and you can teach that. And education is a different craft and it's a different way. And if you understand it, and, I mean, you know that from teaching high school. If you know how to, how to stay organized, you know how to communicate with parents, you know how to maybe run a booster club or things like that. Those are skills that transfer into, into every part of your life from organization and so we we get based i get i've been lucky to get a lot of students that have come through that've been highly organized highly motivated and that love working with kids and once they see the the energy that can come from working with kids and working with other people education is such a natural flow to them because a lot of kids go into music major in college because of their high school teachers and their high school orchestra experience or their high school private teacher so once a kid sees that they can pay back to the community by going back into that it's a, it's a natural flow in terms of wanting to go into performance. I think climate exposing the kids to the climate 
And at the young high school age, you have the luxury of working with the parents also. So you let the parents know what the options are going to be for the kids, where they need to be in order to succeed. And hope, keep your fingers crossed and hope for the best, you know. And then every now and then you get some anomalies that come out that are going to succeed no matter where they go, who, you know, refuse to be products of a machine. And they'll find a way to play and they'll create their own thing. And when you see that energy, you just step back and get out of the way. Dennis, thank you so much for chatting. Wasn't that a great episode? I had such a great time talking about all these topics, opera, technique, standing, music education. What a fascinating conversation. I really hope you enjoyed it. And that's going to do it for our show. I would love to hear from you. If you've written to me before or you've never written before, whether you've been listening for a decade or you just discovered the podcast today, send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. And the best thing you can do for this show is share this episode. If you're listening on your phone, which it's likely you are, there is some sort of share like button, some sort of arrow looking button on the app that you're using right now. I guarantee it, whether it's our app, the actual Contrabase Conversations app, or whether you're listening on your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever, share this out. Share it to Facebook, share it to Twitter, email it to a friend, spread the word about this show. That's how this thing grows. That helps the show more than anything. I so appreciate having you along on this journey with me. I have such a great time doing these episodes. I learn so much, and it's just such an honor for me. It's kind of like doing a do-it-yourself doctoral degree, I tell people a lot, doing these episodes. So thanks for taking the time to listen. And if you're new to the show, we have almost 400 at this point episodes, and they are all at ContraBaseConversations.com. So dig in, enjoy, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.